Now, we've talked about the summary of our illustration process and we are getting to our putting it together stage. So putting it together, before we get into this section, I am going to sidebar here and ask you to go through my book size section in my article. Uh, come back once you've finished that uh, book size guide section because you have to have an understanding of book guidelines to produce quality content. It's very important because it'll save you a lot of time and I made this mistake and I'm trying to save you time. Understand trim sizes, watch some videos and I will link some videos down below for understanding trim sizes and how they work what kind of calculators you need to use. There is a trim calculator that you can download and kind of set your details on. This is all very important stuff before you get started because once you get started putting stuff together, you need to set your page layouts. All right, so let's get back to um, our process. All right, so now that you're back, um, you have to have all your text and all your images and it's time to put all of this together. There are a lot of great options for this part of the journey that are not AI tools. Some examples are Adobe Photoshop. Um, it's a powerful image editor that has lots of features to help you with composition of your images and texts. Adobe Design, uh, it's called InDesign, I believe. It's a versatile layout program that can be used in a variety of projects like posters, books, etc. cetera. Uh, Canva which is personally my favorite. It's a web-based design tool which has apps for the computers uh, that make it easy for you to create pages, videos, and presentations, and even social media content. It's perfect for those who don't have the time or resources to learn how to use Adobe products um, or the cost to purchase Adobe products. And it is a really good alternative to keep something in the web-based app so it's you can go anywhere and kind of consume it and so on and so forth. There's also other tools like Inkscape. It's a vector graphics editor. It's a little bit more complex and it's used to create images and illustrations for books. GIMP is a free image or graphics editor, which is open source. It's great for producing high quality images. Um, and all of these tools will help you get creative with your content. Make sure everything is put together in a professional way. My favorite of all of the above, like I said, was Canva. It's simple web interface and good feature set made it the perfect choice for projects like mine. It allowed me to quickly and easily create professional looking book layouts. It also allowed me to take my work from my laptop to my tablet and even to my mobile phone. So when I am in my bed trying to go to bed, I kept kind of laying out my book. So it's a very comfortable tool to keep using in different places and it's very flexible. All right, so pro tip, spring for the pro version of Canva because of tools like image background remover, etc., and more images and templates and stuff. These are a godsend when you're editing images generated by AI because AI images, like I said, have the inconsistent background details, etc. So having these kind of powerful tools is very, very important and saves you a lot of time and helps you produce real good quality content as evidenced by this. All right, excellent. So once you pick your tool for your layout, you finalize the trim sizes and bleed and what you want to publish. Um, you finalize your storyboard with what, how you want to lay it out. You put your images and your texts together and Finally, after you put your text and images together, you want to fill out important things like copyright page, cover page, back page of the book where you give some details about the book, etc., and so on and so forth. So once you have that done, you want to revise your work, you want to get it all set up, um, and so on and so forth. You also may want to like find out about ISBN numbers, which I am talking about in the published stage. You can kind of, you need to kind of come back and put those ISBN numbers in the page where the copyright is to get the copyright page completed. And from there, you have two pathways. One is the ebook pathway and then the paperback and the hard book 
pathway. For the ebook, I would say download the images and import them into your Kindle creator, uh, book creator, and use that to make your doc mobi file. Uh, for your paperback, I would say take your layout, a PDF, print quality PDF out, and that. So now that you've gotten your book all designed, it's time for the big kahuna, the publishing process. The publishing process simplified is in two categories, publish with a publisher or self-publish. What no one or very little people tell you is, that self-publishing is so easy, even the most novice rookie new to this whole thing. A person like me was able to do it in one day. There are some gotchas though, and I will cover them below. But also note that self-publishing doesn't give you the visibility that a publishing house would get you. Also, you would have to have a lot of learning to do about marketing your book, about where to put it and how to kind of set it up etc and so on and so forth and also you won't have the editing capabilities of big publishing um, houses so think about that when you make your choice but for me self-publishing was very easy and i was more than comfortable doing that i would recommend it to people who are starting off this journey for hobby projects to use that as well all right and i will link a couple of videos down in my description so these are good videos from other YouTube channels and they are very good and cover the processes of self-publishing. What does that look like? And also how to understand that process. And there's another one that talks about the KDP or the Amazon version of self-publishing, trim sizes, book sizes, book types, etc., and so on and so forth. Let's talk about the places that you can use to self-publish. And the popular options that are available are Amazon KDP, which is Amazon's version of self-publish, and Ingram Spark. They are the big hitters. For the sake of simplicity, I picked Amazon KDP. The interface to self-publish on KDP is very intuitive and simple and can be used without much prior experience, as evidenced by my using uh, without much experience from before. Some gotchas include, um, you know, we want to be careful. So use the Kindle book creator to make your Kindle ebook. This simplifies the process a lot. Use the Amazon's inbuilt ISBN generator to simplify the barcodes. Um, and the whole concept about ISBN, etc., is covered in that video that I linked. You can either purchase your own ISBN numbers, which are basically these barcodes, or you could get from Amazon automatically when you self-publish through them, but they will be tied to Amazon if you do that. So just make sure you understand the process and the intricacies involved in ISBN numbers. You, once you have your ISBN numbers, you have the ISBN number in your uh, document, so you have to put it there before you publish it into Amazon, etc. So um, I will cover some gotchas now, right? So pay attention to trim sizes, safe spaces and margins. So these are very important things when you publish in Amazon's um, KDP because they take a very strict view of like margins, bleed, etc., and so on and so forth. Understand what are terms like bleed, margins, safe space. It'll save you a lot of time. If you have a video or a thing that you wanna go, I will try to link one down in the description that will give you an understanding of trim sizes 101 that's all you need so there's also a good calculator from amazon itself that you can use you input your uh, trim size that you want and it'll tell you this is the page layout size that you need to set up in your layout um, uh, designer like canva etc and so on and so forth so yes so important things use the trim size calculator to design your canva page layout um so basically an 8 by 11 is not that it's a little bit extra so just make sure you go through the process and then order proofs in different finishes to actually see how it looks so matte cover versus glossy cover premium versus standard paper you know it gives you an understanding of how these things look in real life and so order the proofs proofs are cheap and they'll come to you very quickly if you order them and once you have them, you will be able to like kind of go through, make edits and stuff and so on and so forth before you actually publish the book. So um, use tools like Jasper AI, etc. 
to um, uh, write your summary and your descriptions um, and then publish away. That's all you have to do. Let's summarize our publishing process. Now that you've gone through the steps of completing your layout, etc., gotten your files that are needed for publishing, uh, you pick your finish, which like I mentioned, it's a very important part where you pick your finish, which is gloss or not, uh, gloss or matte. Um, and then you pick your bleed style, etc., and so on and so forth. You set your price um, and then you order your proofs. So once you order your proofs, make sure you proofread. I had to order at least four to five different times because every time I missed something. So um, yes, I have a lot of my books that have this not for resale sign, which come with the proofs uh, in our house. So we have a lot of them. Uh, it works very well if you're trying to publish a coloring book, which one of this is. So we have a lot of coloring books at the house. So anyway, you do your proofs, um, you double check, triple check, quadruple check them, and then finally you hit publish. So the important point is once you hit publish for at least the physical copies of your book, which are the paperback and the hard book, um, hardcover, uh, you will be, you cannot make changes. You will have to republish them and so on and so forth. So there's a whole process there. So for the Kindle ebook, you can make changes, push, push them and all that stuff. But for the pub physical versions, you want to be really careful to finish proofreading your, your full book before you publish it. And that is in a nutshell, the publishing process. All right. So next we are going to look at some pitfalls, etc., and so on and so forth. Pitfalls to be aware of in this whole process. While generative AI tools can be incredibly helpful, there are a few pitfalls you should be aware of. One of the biggest challenges is that the AI algorithms are not always perfect and can sometimes produce unexpected results. You may find that some of your text is misinterpreted or that your illustrations are not exactly what you had in mind. It is very important that you have a human element to revising, editing your content, etc., because of this exact reason. This is, in my opinion, one of the biggest pitfalls and something you have to be fully aware of in every step of the way. All right. Then next thing I want to talk about is the licensing considerations. This is an important part because a lot of people assume that the version you're using of these tools, like for example, ChatGPT or Midjourney, the free version will give you the license to use it commercially, your art form and stuff. It's not really true. I have linked a couple of articles in the description below that talk about specifically for ChatGPT and Midjourney and DALI, what are the licensing considerations? Essentially, if you pay for the paid tier, you can use them for commercial use, etc., and so on and so forth. So you may want to check those licensing considerations before you go forward. If you're using images that are going to be exactly carried over and use it exactly um, on your side of things. So make sure you check your licensing considerations before you move forward with publishing. And that's an important part of it. This is a very important topic for me to discuss. It's controversial, it's controversy over fair use policy. Now, it's an important, it's an important topic for me to address because it asks this question that's very important. Do works produced by generative AI tools not give enough monetary and name contributions to the artists and authors whose works are being used for the underlying data set? That's the question. And the answer to that question, according to me at least, is yes. Although the artwork or text being generated is unique, it has used some baseline data to come up with it. I would posit that at least the tools the least thing they can do is cite references and sources for the content 
And I understand sometimes this is too complex in a very complex model, but I believe there should be a way for us to reference content that is being used in the data set. And as far as the monetary compensation part is concerned, I really don't have a good answer. We will have to wait and see how this landscape plays out with all the lawyers, et cetera, being involved and how this whole generative AI piece will come into fruition from a legal slash licensing slash fair use policy perspective. In conclusion, generative AI tools offer a fantastic opportunity to help us write and illustrate children's books. Whether you're an experienced author or just starting out, these tools can help you bring your stories to life in a fast and efficient and convenient way. With the benefits of using AI, the process of creating a book has become easier and more accessible. If you're interested in exploring this new technology, give one of these tools a try and see what kind of amazing results you can achieve. If you wanna take a look at some of my results, I put the links below and I put a screenshot over here. Follow the journey.